Welcome to Expansion and Growth, Finding Clues in the Federal Census from 1850 to 1900. Just to recap, this session is being made available as a part of Roots Tech 2021. My name is Michael Strauss, and I'm an accredited genealogist in the Mid-Atlantic region of the United States. This is part two of uh, our census sessions. Part one covered 1850 to 1870, and this continues with 1880 through 1900. Uh, this census session continues with the beginning of using 1880s census as it's a nice break in between the years as the end of reconstruction occurs in between the decades of 1870 and 1880. Reconstruction officially ends in 1877 with the withdrawal of federal troops under the presidency of Rutherford B. Hayes. This new era is ushered in and it's known as the Gilded Age. And this time period covers 1877 to around 1900. Now the term Gilded Age was coined by Mark Twain. He wrote a novel called The Gilded Age, A Tale of Today in 1873. Unlike the Reconstruction era, which was known for violence, for corruption, for fraud and for political turmoil, the Gilded Age was one of extensive and substantial growth, both in industry and for immigration of immigrants who come to the country here as newly citizens beginning their, their life journey. The first president during the Gilded Age was James A. Garfield. Now, when we look at the census data, we'll see that it's very similar from the previous census years just again, adding a lot more information. We'll have a different look with the 1890, but we're gonna begin with the 1880 census that was taken on June 1st of that year. The population that was enumerated was a little more than 50 million individuals. There were 38 states that were enumerated. And since the previous decade, Colorado had been added in 1876. This would include 12 territories. Just a little bit of background about the 1880 census. This was the first census to record more fully in both cities and other urban areas, the exact street addresses where individual families lived. Now this is important because if you cannot find someone in the census that you believe is at a location and you have an address for them, this is where looking at city directories will actually help you find the family more readily in looking at the census returns, especially if it's been misspelled or if the uh, census itself is a little more or less illegible and it was just read wrong by either the census taker or whoever indexed it. This is also the first census to ask the relationship of each member of the household to the head of family. So you can include not only sons, daughters, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, cousins, it could also take into account servants and those who lived in the household who had no relationship, but the relationship was given that they worked for the head of household. This census also had the special schedule that I had mentioned in part one called the defective dependent and delinquent class schedule, which I will discuss a little later. I do have an example that I wanna share with you of an 1880 census. This one comes from the state of Indiana. This was a man by the name of William Woolen. William Woolen was an attorney and lived in Indianapolis, Indiana. You can see at the top of the header where, uh, where he was recorded at. And you can see also stamped at the top that the census data was received on July 15th of 1880. Like all the returns we've talked about in the past and certainly the ones to come, the returns took more than certainly more than several weeks. It took months for the returns to be finalized and an additional number of months to tabulate and index and make available the data that was collected from each of these returns. Woolen, besides being an attorney by profession, was also a well-known naturalist. His information on the return is in the top lines. He's listed as the head of family, and with him are other family members. It lists their specific relationship to him, his wife, and a number of his children ending at the very bottom with a servant that lived in the household. Again, also it lists their occupation, the place of birth, as well as the place of birth of both the mother and the father of each individual asked on each line. 
So the data contained in the 1880 census went well above and beyond the prior decades. We have new information now being asked. Lots more genealogy details are available than we had in previous decades. But because the 1880 was special in this regard, I had mentioned about the DDT schedule. Again, this was a supplemental form. It was officially titled Defective, Dependent, and Delinquent Class Schedules. But it had specific schedules geared towards individuals. There was a separate schedule for the insane. There was a separate schedule for idiots, those who were deaf mutes, those who were blind, homeless children, people that were in prisons, both state and federal, and finally, indignant or paupers that were part of this return. All of this information was recorded in 1880 as a supplemental form of the census that's made available for the entire United States. It can be acquired the same way you look at the regular US census returns. Many of these have been digitized and they're available online on many of the pay sites. Five years later, I had also mentioned in part one about a special territorial schedule. This was done in the year, again, 1885. This is often overlooked by genealogists. I don't want to have any confusion on this though. Do not confuse this with additional state enumerated census. The state census was enumerated at the state level and was authorized by state session laws and statutes. This was one that was federal based. This would be housed in the national archives and not at a state archive or library, but it's not available for all areas. The available territories include Colorado, Florida, Nebraska, New Mexico, and an area known as the Dakota territories. Clearly this takes in both North and South Dakota. Included in this census return is much the same information as the prior 1880 census return. It includes the relationship of each head of household to that individual, just like the 1880 return. It included the place of birth of those being enumerated, just the same as it was in the 1880 census return. Now, the next census that we need to look at, the one that most genealogists know that was destroyed by fire, of course, was the 1890 census. Now, all the previous census returns were taken on June 1st. You'll note here, there's a difference. This one was taken and began on June 2nd of 1890. And the reason it was, was because this census return June 1st was a Sunday. Because it was a Sunday, they started the following day and the return was done starting on June 2nd. This return took into account over the period of time that it was taken, more than 62, nearly 63 million individuals who were finally enumerated at the end of this census taking in 1890. There were 44 states now enumerated. And from the previous decade, there were several new states added. These included North Dakota in 1889, South Dakota in 1889. Remember, both of them were formerly territories. Now they were now individual states. Montana was also added as well as Washington the same year in 1889. Idaho was added in 1890, and finally Wyoming was added in 1890 as well. This also included several territories. June 1st again was a Sunday, and just to recap, the census was recorded on the following day. Now the 1890 census was housed for a number of years at the United States Commerce Building located at 19th and Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. On January 10th, 1921, that census was destroyed by a fire. Most of the return did not survive. Initially, it was reported that census returns from as early as 1790 had been burned, but in reality, when they checked their facts and figures, it was really the 1890 that had seen the burning. Uh, what did, however, also did burn was a partial destruction of the veteran schedules, which did survive but only partially for part of the states. I will get into those uh, a little bit later. You can see an article here from the Lancaster County, Pennsylvania Intelligence or Journal dated the day after on January 11th, 1921. And the header of that article telling us that the census records were destroyed by fire. Again, what remained was the veteran schedule. Half of Kentucky, 
and Louisiana to Wyoming did survive, where the early part in the, the beginning of the alphabet, A through K, did not survive the fire. On the final roll of these uh, returns for veterans, there also is included some regular military personnel, including those that served on Navy vessels, those that served in Navy uh, yards, and several forts and other military army installations. Now the return itself is gonna look different. This is gonna be a very different return than the ones in the previous decades. There's not going to be another return like this. This one is unique in that its layout is very different. So just to recap on some of the facts and figures related to the 1890. This is the last census taken in the 19th century. Most of this census was again destroyed by fire on January 10th of 1921. The census again had a different layout than the previous years. Families were recorded on individual pages. So the families were laid out very differently. Individual pages were set aside for individual families. All the questions that had to be answered were listed vertically from top to bottom, just as you see displayed on this slide. So they were not left to right, they were rather top to bottom. So running a totally different direction. There was service asked during the regular return of former Civil War veterans, although there was a special return that was taken, but it was actually part of the original 1890 return. And it was one of the early questions asked as part of question two. Again, just to recap that the veteran schedule is again, not available for all states. Now, because so few of these exist, there's only several thousand of these exist that do exist that have survived. Ancestry on their website has digitized nearly all of these. So the collection that they have is about as complete as it's going to get. I have an example of one from 1890 to share with you that's been filled out and it's very clear. It's, uh, the writing is really good. This is Otis Mason who lived in the District of Columbia. It's one of the largest areas that did survive of the existent extant census records. He was employed as a uh, professor and one of their educated personnel that worked for the Smithsonian Institute. And you can see him pictured here on the same page with the rest of the members of his family. Again, the questions are reading down, but if you look left to right, you see Otis listed next door to him is his wife, two of his children follow, and then there's a servant who lives in the home. One page was dedicated to the family of Otis Mason. This entire page was dedicated to that family unit. At the very top, I've also boxed in an area indicating that he resided at 1385 Q Street inside of the District of Columbia. And you can see the rest of the family unit there. But I did want to make mention and just talk a little bit more in depth about the veteran schedule that did manage to survive, at least far more schedules than from the original 1890. This special schedule was intended to include Union soldiers and sailors. Now, this was including revenue cutter service personnel. So this is a forerunner of the Coast Guard. So it was taking into account Navy and revenue cutter service and Marines who had all served during the Civil War or their widows if the soldier, sailor, or Marine was dead by 1890. The census enumerators were given specific instructions not to include former Confederates. Unfortunately, they did not read the instructions very clearly. And in many of the Southern states like Virginia, for an example, that do exist, they included Confederates who had formerly served. When they caught this error, they intended to cross the names out, but in doing so, they didn't cross them out to the point where you couldn't read them. And they're often very readable. There were also questions asked within this return. It was only intended for the Civil War, but because they didn't follow the instructions for Confederates, it made logical sense that there might be other errors found within this set of records. And because of that, there were a limited number of veterans from the War of 1812, from the Seminole Wars of the 1830s, and even men who were enumerated 
who had spent time in the Mexican-American War of 1846 that had found their way onto these census rolls. The example I have here are these two men that I've highlighted that are two former Mexican-American War veterans. They should not have been included on this return if the instructions were read and followed. It included the name of the soldier or widow and the indication of what regiment they served or what ship they served on, when they enlisted, when they were discharged, and it computed their time in service in years, months, and days. Below, it included information about if they had suffered any service-related disability or had been wounded. In larger cities, it gave their address, their post office uh, information. It included lots of detailed data. This was a unique role, unlike other roles that were non-population schedules. It was a wealth of genealogy information. The final census that we're gonna talk about in part two is the 1900 census. We go back to that same date of June 1st, 1900. The population by this time is more than 76 million individuals. There are now 45 states enumerated. And since the previous decade of 1890, the only additional state that's added is Utah, which is added in 1896. As Utah, uh, as you should probably know from your history books, Utah is granted statehood only after they acknowledge that polygamy is uh, not going to work and the manifesto is passed by the president of the church, uh, Wilfred Woodruff, who in turn moves forward with the idea that the, the territory of Utah would then be admitted as a new state. This also will include six territories. The 1900 census has some really unique data. You can see here. It's the first census since the return of the 20th century. It includes for the very first time, and it's the only one that includes the month and year of birth of all persons enumerated. It's very different. It includes the years married for individuals. This is also new. And on the mother's line, it even asks the number of children living and number born to the mother. So if there were any that died, you get that full number count. Citizenship is also really talked about in this census. The number of years are, are given since immigration uh, to the United States on any that are immigrating. It included citizenship status, whether they were alien, whether they filed their first papers or whether they were fully naturalized. Occupation on when anyone was unemployed was also asked. And finally, it asked in one of the last columns whether individuals owned or mortgaged their own property or rented their own property. I have an example from a 1900 schedule I'd like to share with you. This is uh, Anna Dickinson, who was uh, living as a boarder in the household of George Akeley in the Bronx, New York. She was a well-known former abolitionist and suffragette and even a former national order, well-known in the United States. She is listed here with a family unit, but is obviously a boarder living in the home. You can see her listed there. Finally, the non-population schedules are the last thing that I wanted to kind of focus on. These are again, the supplementary schedules that were taken. Uh, I've noted all of these in part one and part two throughout these two sessions, again, including agriculture, farming information, manufacturing industry, including specific business details, mortality, including deaths, social statistics, including community organizations, veteran schedules, including the former Civil War soldiers, and of course, the slave schedules that I talked about in part one, not only talking about the slaves themselves, but the slave owners uh, owning their property or chattel. Uh, I'm going to end as I begin with an image uh, that I think is appropriate for ending our time together with these two sessions on the United States Census. Due to the population growth in the census over the time of the end of the Reconstruction era and the beginning of the Gilded Age, it became necessary to collect data, especially during the 1880 census, in a more efficient and effective means. And a man by the name of Herman Hollerith invented a tabular machine that was used to collect and to count the data faster. Obviously, it was a little faster, but it's not what we as genealogists today employ as we use obviously more sophisticated methods to tabulate our data on computer programs and using lots of great internet sites to help us in our research journey. 
I hope that you enjoyed these two sessions. I hope you were able to get something out of them. And I thank you for attending this session and invite you to watch the other sessions that Roots Tech 2021 offers as all of them are a means to you to, to forward your genealogy and to learn more about your family history. And again, I thank you for your time.